Welcome to Chapter 37, Ecosystems and Communities. Okay, so let's talk about community ecology. Now, a community is a group of animals or organisms that share the same area. Now, it, it's a, a multitude of species that live in the same area. And of course, they're gonna interact with each other. So what we're looking at here is a perfect example of a community in the uh, Kenyan savanna, in the African savannas. So what we're seeing here is a lioness and her prey right there, zebra. There's a competitor, the hyena, and then there's some um, scavengers that are uh, interacting as well. And then don't forget all of the plants in the area are part of this community. So all of these different species living together and that are potentially interacting or already interacting is a community. And community ecologists study um, the way communities operate. They look into things um, such as interspecific interactions, interactions between different species. Okay, so let's look at some of the interspecific interactions that exist. All right, so this is a great table to uh, reference back to because it tells us the interaction in this column, okay? And then it describes in the, the next column the effect on species one, the, the effect on species two. Now this is non-specific. This is just a general uh, effect. And then it gives an example. All right, so um, when there's competition between two species, this is gonna have a negative effect on both species, negative, negative. When there's a mutualistic relationship, it will benefit both, so it'll be positive, positive. Predation, when there's a predator-prey relationship, the predator will benefit, the prey will not. Herbivory, so any animal that eats plants uh, is gonna benefit and the plant itself will not. Parasitism and pathogens, the, the, parasite, path, uh, the parasite benefits and the host will suffer. Okay, so before we finish or continue that discussion, there's some important factors that we have to cover. For example, uh, this is a not just a definition, but it's an entire concept. A species has a niche. Uh, it's pronounced niche sometimes. Um, either way, it is... The, uh, an animal's niche is their physical habitat, so where the space that they occupy, but also the favorable environmental conditions that they need for their survival. It also includes things like their nesting sites or a denning site, depending on the animal, the type of food that they eat, the type, uh, the how much water they consume. Um, if it competes with other organisms. Now here's the rule when it comes to animals and their niche. No two species can ever occupy the same niche. It is impossible. There has to be a slight difference. And if they are ever exposed and they do require the same things, um, this just, it's not going to work out. One species will always outcompete the other. And to kind of hit this point home, some research has been done on the subject and they've written something called the competitive exclusion principle. It's also referred to it's also referred to as the Gaussian uh, competition or the Gaussian competitive exclusion principle because this is the scientist, uh, that's his last name, that did the study to support this theory. And um, basically this is what he did. It's pretty interesting. He uh, is very simple. He took two paramecium. See these little guys right here? 
that's a paramecium, remember? And this is another type of paramecium. There are two different types, right? Now, uh, the one is represented with the blue line, paramecium aurelia. The red line is paramecium caudatum. Now, here's the thing. These guys are so close. They're the same genus, but they're a different species. Um, and they, they actually require the same resources, similar niche, um, and that creates an issue. All right, so this is what he did to show that it is impossible for one species, two species, to occupy the same niche. So he, he took these organisms and he grew them in separate flasks, okay, over 24 days. And so separate flasks. Now remember a flask is just a that's a I'm just sketch of a little flask there real quick. Okay, so he he put he put each organism in its oops. Okay, I think you get the idea. Okay, in their own flask. Okay, one in here one in here, and he gave them all of the food that they needed and nutrients and all of that. And look what's happening here. Now we're looking at population density, and we see both of them grow in separate flasks exponentially, and then they reach their carrying capacity, and the growth shifts to logistic growth. Okay, fine. Now, he grew them again in the same flask, that means he put them together, right? And that is when the problem is created be because what happens is, okay, these guys are gonna grow and so will these guys now at a certain time, now here is by day nine, what happens? Uh, one species is completely wiped out while the other one will continue to grow. And, uh, grow into it'll shift into the logistic growth and it, logistic growth curve and grow normally okay so in conclusion his experiment showed us that no two species can ever occupy the same niche one species will always out compete the other leading them to ex extinction this is called interspecific competition. This whole experiment uh, led to this competitive exclusion principle. All right, now let's look at some more uh, interactions. So we talked about interspecific competition. Um, now here's a great example. This interspecific, again, is when two populations, two organisms, two different species, and that's the key word, different. Uh, species. They compete for the same resources, whether it's food, water, light um, with plants. Plants compete for light, um, territory. So what we're looking at, of course, is the typical classic lion and hyena. They're two different species, but they do require similar resources and they're always competing. And this will have a negative impact on both species negative negative intra specific where it's intra tra intra specific competition occurs when it is when competition occurs between members of the same species so they it, this is very common but it is the most fierce competition there is because these animals um, are equipped with the same weapons, you can call them, the same, you know, anatomy, teeth, claws, uh, horns in this case. And it is the most fierce competition in the world is uh, the competition between two of the same species. These guys are at it too. All right, so that's intraspecific. That's the same species. Inter, T-E-R, is two different species. All right. Now, 
species um, that require the same resources are going to suffer on both accounts. And uh, ultimately, you know, they, for example, th this is an old, uh, this is an old example. So these two birds, okay, they require the same resources and they inhabit the same niche and it negatively impacts both species. They cannot fully thrive and they never will be able to. However, if when scientists removed one species, the other one was significantly more successful in raising their offspring. And, you know, that further supports the competitive exclusion principle. A mutualistic relationship is pretty common. Every, everyone's heard this term. This is going to benefit both. It's mutually beneficial. So the examples we have here, so it's positive, positive. The examples we have here is uh, this is coral, um, and what we can't see is the algae inside. And the coral gains energy um, from sugars produced by the algae because algae is photosynthetic. And in turn, the algae gains shelter. It gets uh, access to light, carbon dioxide, um, ammonium, which is a source of nitrogen that is required for nutrients. And so, you know, that's a, an example of mutually beneficial relationship. We have a mutually beneficial relationship um, with bacteria. So our microflora um, and the bacteria in our human GI tract. Okay. Uh, they help us break down uh, food. They also occupy physical space that protect us from harmful bacteria. And in turn, we our body provides them with shelter, nutrients, um, oxygen, pretty much everything they need. Uh, the other ones are, this example is the acacia tree and the acacia ant. There's the acacia ant. So the acacia tree makes this nectar, and the acacia ants, um, they live on the tree. And they feed off the nectar, and in turn, they completely defend the tree. They are actually cut somewhat fearsome. So if any other organism, any other insect comes near the the acacia tree, the acacia ants will attack it in full force. And so that's a mutualistic relationship. All right, any pollinators, that's mutually beneficial. And there is something called cleaning symbiosis that is uh, mutually beneficial. And I will show you some examples later. Predation. Predation is very straightforward. This is when there's a predator that kills and eats another animal, which is the prey. Now, predation adaptations have evolved over uh, the course of, you know, evolutionary history. So animals, predators, have become fast. They've developed acute senses. Um, they've evolved claws, teeth, fangs, stingers, um, you know, st and, or some of them also have poisons that can subdue uh, their prey, um, like snakes do that, okay, and then of course they're completely agile, and uh, as predators evolve, so do the prey. So as they, these guys get faster and more agile and they evolve these senses, in turn, the, pre the prey are also getting faster. Their, their senses are also, um, you know, developing as well. And they are basically going through something called predator-prey co-evolution co-evolve. That means they evolved together and they evolve in response to one another. Um, so here we can clearly see this, this little guy. He's almost got his prey, but this prey is giving him a run for his money um, because he, he is quick. Uh, this is interesting. This is a porcupines. Porcupines have evolved defenses because they're not fast and they're, they're not going to be fast, but they have evolved their their spines and uh, this guy is kind of testing to see what's going to happen there but uh if he does touch this animal and he gets stung he will never do it again 
So other things that have um, come from predator prey coevolution, um, of course, these are adaptations from natural selection. So there's passive defenses, passive defenses and active defenses. Passive defenses are going to be things like toxins, spines, thorns. Okay, so animals tend to, I'm sorry, plants tend to do this. They tend to evolve spines and thorns. Why? Because it's a defense to protect them. Um, they've also, animals have also evolved cryptic coloration, which we're going to discuss. Um, now, active defenses is escaping or defensive fighting. Now, here uh, is a perfect example of cryptic coloration. Camouflage is one of them. Um, if you look closely, can you see what is in this, uh, in this tree? Okay, this is the little frog. And he is completely camouflaged. Right? So that's one um, defense. And this is the monarch butterfly. And if you look very closely at this image, it's actually spraying chemicals, toxic chemicals. So um, the monarch butterfly has, you know, it's, not, it's basically evolved defenses. And a lot of organisms have in response to predators because it's, it's just natural selection in a nutshell. Okay, here are some more uh, examples of predator prey coevolution and camouflage. Uh, this is the leafy sea dragon. See this little guy right here? He looks like a plant and he is not. Now it's advantageous for him to look like a plant because other big fish are not going to want to eat plants because they're carnivores. They're going to want to eat fish. So that's a defense mechanism. These are obvious, uh, clearly thorns. Thorns are, are a passive defense mechanism. These ones are interesting. These are cacti that look like rocks. And they have evolved to look like this so that birds and other organisms will not eat them. Uh, this is the horn lizard, completely camouflaged. And look at this uh, camouflage snow leopard. And of course, if there was snow out on the floor, uh, on the grounds, um, it would be white. Okay, another thing that they have animals have evolved as as a direct response of predator prey coevolution is uh, pretty funny. They they some organisms have. Um, decided to taste very badly. Uh, so um, I guess they didn't decide, they evolved this bad taste. Um, plants do this, um, so that's one defense. Um, some organisms can sting, of course, like the bee, and then mimicry. Mimicry is really interesting to me because it, it's kind of hilarious. So what mimicry is, think of the word mimic, right? It's when a harmless animal, meaning it, it, it has no toxins, it's not venomous, um, a harmless species has evolved to resemble a dangerous species. Okay, and uh, that's pretty, it's just interesting. So here what we're looking at, this is the coral snake, and these are very poisonous. And this is the scarlet king snake, not poisonous at all, but it has evolved to look like a poisonous snake. Um, this one's pretty funny too. This is the classic bee. Everybody knows bees um, are venomous. And this little guy is a hoverfly. Not dangerous at all, but he's got the, the colors of a bee and he has mimicked the colors and the pattern of the bee to as, as a decoy um, to basically um, protect itself from being an easy target. This is another uh, pretty interesting mimicry. Uh, this is an insect. This is a caterpillar. And what does he look like? Looks like a snake. OK. 
Okay, other predator prey coevolution. Okay, starter, startle coloration, warning coloration. Okay, this startle coloration is this is a perfect example. The, the idea is to resemble um, a much larger animal by uh, showing eyes that are not real eyes, they're false eyes. So this is the back end of a frog, and there's the false eyes right there. And what what is the purpose of that? to make it look like it's a big animal and it works um, now this one's pretty interesting now warning coloration is this animals evolve these brightly colored pad patterns as a way to warn um, to warn predators that uh, an animal it has chemical defenses. So these bright colors are basically saying, I have poison, I have chemicals come near me and I will release them. And that those colors are uh, indeed effective. And actually this particular organism does have um, chemical defenses. Okay, herbivory. So think of being an herbivore. Now, plants are, are living organisms. Um, now, the eating a plant, anything that eats a plant is an or herbivore. <laughs> it's beneficial to the herbivore and negatively impacts the, uh, the plant. So what do plants do to protect themselves? Well, uh, they're pretty smart. So they've evolved spines, thorns, bitter taste, toxic chemicals. So this is the foxglove. It's very pretty, but it does not have nectar. No, nope. it has toxic chemicals and it keeps herbivores away because animals are smart enough to learn. They learn, okay, that, that's got, you know, chemicals in, and they won't go near it. Okay, this is a, a very cool, um, this is a very cool uh, study. Um, so, in, in an example of coevolution. So, we know caterpillars eat leaves. Now, this particular caterpillar um, is typically attracted to this very particular plant, this passion flower vine. And ultimately, the flowers that grow on this plant release some toxins that repel other herbivores and it works. Uh, however, the caterpillar, this guy right here, he's got digestive enzymes that break down the toxin. And so the flower uh, had to evolve new defenses. So what it did it is actually so funny because um, uh, the caterpillar typically will lay its eggs on the leaves of this this plant. There's a picture of the eggs. Okay, so the flower started to deposit these decoy eggs because, of course, the caterpillar is not going to eat leaves that has its babies on it, right? So there it is, genius. And this is a plant and caterpillar that have evolved these brilliant tactics against one another. Parasites and pathogens. Okay, now this is really nothing new. You guys know what parasites and path pathogens are. These are things that make you sick. Um, you know, an endoparasite can be something like a heartworm. The, the virus HIV, any other virus is an endoparasite. Um, also bacterial infections. All right. <clears throat> and they're typically small. Large parasites are ectoparasites like leeches. Um, also the lamprey. All right. They, however, they are dangerous. They can have effects that range from uh, that are mild to death and it can actually reduce a population's density and it can affect reproductive potential depending on what the infection is, what the parasite is, what the pathogen is. Okay, th these are obviously worms, intestinal worms. Okay. 
Okay, so the next thing we're looking at here is, this is called a food web. So a lot of the time uh, we will use with the term food chain, but in reality, it's a food web. It's just easier to use the chain. So what we mean by web is exactly what this looks like in this picture. It looks like a web. Now, the important factors here are the following. Producers. All of our plants are producers. They make all of the food and oxygen we need for survival. And anything that eats a plant is a primary consumer. Okay. And anything that eats a primary consumer is a secondary consumer. Now, secondary consumers can be both primary and secondary. However, now, anything that eats a secondary consumer is a tertiary consumer. And then above that is a quaternary consumer. All right, now I'm not gonna go through the whole web, but the fact is that we have these. Uh, we have primary consumers, um, producers, sorry, uh, pr to primary consumers, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. And what's being passed are nutrients and energy. Okay. Now, within a community, actually, I'm going to come back to this slide. Let me just, oh, I can't. Never mind. Okay, species, let me just, all right, so keep that in mind, this. Keep this in mind, and we're going to come back to, to this, uh, this concept. All right, now, inside of our communities, um, the, what we prefer in general is we like diversity, we want diversity. We never want one species to dominate the other. Um, it just takes away from the um, complexity and beauty of life. And we want species richness. Species richness is the number of different species within a community. So we want many to be there, we don't want a disproportionate amount of organisms. So what we're showing here is uh, woodlot A, woodlot B. Now what's happening in woodlot A is there's a dominant plant, this one. And there's a couple others, right? But they are disproportionate. Okay, so let's say you're going through a walk, for a walk in this woodlot A would it be all that exciting, I suppose, because you're just looking at the same tree over and over and over again. Okay, you might glance one of these. Woodlot B is the ideal because there is a proportionate distribution of the different organisms. So we have this tree, we have quite a bit of this tree, we have these guys, and, and so on. And so your walk through the woodlot B is going to be a lot more interesting. And uh, ultimately, that's just a very one, two, three example. And um, so basically, we want a um, diverse community in general. A diverse tree community is going to is going to promote a diverse animal community. And um, it's it, it's what is uh, ideal. Okay, this table is just showing the uh, the concentration of 80% of woodlot A was this tree, which that was obvious, and then uh, you know 10% was this, 5% was this tree or this plant, and 5% and was this tree. Now woodlot B was a lot better in the sense that they were equally distributed. Okay, this is the ideal situation. All right, in a community we have something um, that kind of holds together the diversity. Because remember, we don't want one organism taking over or we don't want one species to dominate. 
And scientists have been studying this for quite a long time. And they have come to realize that within every community, there is, some, there is one species called the keystone species that holds the entire community together, meaning that um, it, it, it holds the diversity together. And without that keystone species, the whole community would fall apart. Okay, so this is uh, a classic study and it's, this is in Washington State. It's the intertidal zone in Washington State. Okay, and we are looking at this particular species of starfish. All right, now here's the thing. Now, this is an old study, goes back to the 60s, and this is what, what was happened. This is what happened. All right, this is how they supported the keystone species theory. Okay, so they, let's look at this graph. Okay, we're looking at years. 60s to the 70s number of species present now we're talking about this coast the the intertidal coast in, in Washington very specific area and the study shows that there's about 16 15 16 species okay and this includes includes this um this starfish There it is, right there. Okay, so when the starfish is present, the um, diversity is maintained. There's 15 and, and more species, up to 20 over you know the course of approximately 10 years. This is good. We want that. We want diversity. Okay, now they did this. They took a section and they removed our starfish and what happens you see this crash it crashed all the way within three years it crashed all the way to one species only okay so they removed the keystone species well they didn't know he was the keystone until this study but they remove him and the whole community collapses no more community Everything's gone, except for one species, this, the purple sea urchin. It completely wiped out everything, all of the mussels and barnacles and all of the organisms that live there, the 20 plus, 15 plus species uh, that live there. So why? What happened? How could this be? How is this starfish so essential? Well, it turns out that the starfish was a very particular predatory starfish. Okay, it preyed on mussels and it also preyed on the sea urchin. And being a predator um, keeps, predators have their role. Um, they keep things in check. Um, in fact, you know, um, our typical predators like our um, lions and wolves and cougars and these big cats, they're important because if we didn't have them, there would just be an, an influx of grazers. Okay, so they dubbed this the keystone species and then they started looking at all of the communities and realizing that there there's one or more keystone species that holds everything together okay so that's what a keystone species is let's go ahead and look at a bigger picture here this is looking at the whole world all right now our our planet is um very uh, self-sufficient um, really it, the damages that are going on around the world are human impact inflicted um, okay so our scientists go out there and they they estimate something called the net 
primary productivity. And they do this, and um, what it means is, think of the word net primary production or productivity. This is how much energy and oxygen is made via photosynthesis. And where does that come from? Um, of course, it comes from plants. Okay, so an area that has a lot of plants it is going to have a high, um, high amount of productivity. All right, now, and, okay. Now, on top of that, we have something called biomass. Biomass is a measurement. <laughs> it's a measurement per square meters of how much energy is there. Um, okay, so basically, to make this simple, the more plants and water and vegetation, the more oxygen and energy is produced, right? And why do we need this? For everything. We need it for survival. We cannot live without the energy made by plants. We cannot live without the oxygen made by plants, there would be no nothing on the planet. Remember the story with about the dinosaurs and why they were wiped out? They were wiped out because all the plants died. I mean, the asteroid definitely had an impact, but it was really because of the debris that was kicked up and it blocked the sun out and the plants died. All right, so this is important because they go around and they tell us, okay, this is the most productive area, this is the most productive area, and so on. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look. Um, the most productive are actually algae beds and coral reef, which is great, but what's happening to our coral reef? Our oceans are being polluted, our coral reef are being bleached out. Okay, and then next is our, our tropical rainforest. So these are tropics right there. Okay, they are the, the second most productive area in the world. And then we have our other forests. Okay, the just temperate forests. The savannas are productive. Um, the boreal forests, the, the taiga area, which is right before the... Um, right before the um, tundra, okay, uh, temperate grasslands. The tundra is not very productive at all, and the desert is not very productive at all. And then these eustuaries right here, okay, these like marshy areas where the uh, fresh water meets salt water, very productive. Okay, so this is very helpful to us. And this also is important in conservation biology where we know what we need to conserve. Um, and it is our forests. Okay, this is the picture I was trying to get to earlier. Now I want to make a major point here. Now, this is more of a food chain. And each level, the producer level, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, quaternary consumer. This is called the, these are called trophic levels. So I want you to learn that term. And what we're showing is the uh, producers in on land and in the ocean. Okay, producers in the ocean, uh, I'm sorry, in on land, plants. Okay, um, Primary consumers, um, so our plants are consumed by primary consumers. Okay, grasshopper is a great example. Okay, primary consumers are consumed by secondary consumers, which are consumed by tertiary consumers. So here there's a mouse eating the grasshopper. The mouse eats the, or the snake eats the mouse, and then the hawk is at the top of the food, the, the food chain. The quaternary consumer. Now in the ocean, who's the uh, cons the producers? Phytoplankton. These are photosynthetic organisms. 
And primary consumers are zooplankton, which are small, um, small, uh, like, sea creatures, right? Okay, and then secondary consumers are medium-sized fish. Tertiary consumers are big fish. And then quaternary consumers are the whales and sharks. Okay, these are called trophic levels. Now, when we, when this, there's rules to this, uh, there's rules in, in regards to energy. Okay, so when energy is passed from one trophic level to the next, they're only passing 10% of the total energy that they've made. And I want you to remember that. So this plant can make, you know, 10,000 kilocalories, but, and it's going to use some, and of course this animal is not going to get all of it. It's going to get 10% only, okay, from up here. The next guy, he, this plant, this, uh, sorry, this grasshopper, he's going to use some of that energy for his own self and so on. And so by the time it gets to the, um, the next level, it's only going to get 10% of what it has left. And then again, this mouse is going to use up all kinds of energy as well and will only pass on 10%. So basically, in other words, 90% of energy is lost as it passes from one trophic level to the next. Okay, very simple concept, and that's that. All right, the next thing we're gonna look at is the carbon cycle. So we have a cycle of carbon. We need carbon for um, building uh, organic compounds. And who builds organic compounds? Plants. So we have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's taken up by photosynthesis. Okay, passed on. Algae and cyanobacteria as well. Passed as primary consumers. Um, and then passed to higher level consumers. CO2 is returned to the atmosphere through cellular respiration. Okay, including us and plants do cellular respiration as well. Um, now, organic compounds are broken down by our decomposers, detrius decomposers, and then returned to the, uh, the atmosphere. Every living organism that dies is eventually decomposed and their carbon is returned to the atmosphere. Okay, um, now burning wood and fossil fuels is pumping tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is a big, big problem, huge. Now ever since the industrial revolution, when factories were developed and uh, we started burning coal. Coal is cheap and um, it's an energy source. Um, we have had a huge problem. Now, what's happening in this graph is we're seeing atmospheric CO2 has gone up exponentially and it's still going up. And this is a, a, a graph of the global surface temperature. And you'll see that it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. But what is it doing overall? It's going up. And why is this a problem? Okay, it's a problem because we're losing our polar ice caps. And what happens to ice when it gets hot? It melts. Just ask Olaf. Oh wait, he doesn't know. <laughs> um, okay, so what we're looking at here is a, this is called the Muir Glacier, 1941. And the fact is that this glacier, um, used to be pretty impressive. This is all frozen, all of this. 
and it is, this is 2004, I don't know what it looks like now. It's not frozen anymore. It's a, literally a lake. We are losing our polar ice caps. Why? Because uh, one of the reasons is CO2. The other is methane gas, nitrous oxide. And this is, this is what, what's going on. We have something called the greenhouse gas effect. Now, what is a greenhouse for? Okay, we live in California, so we don't see them that often, but greenhouses, they were made to trap heat inside of the house so that people can grow their vegetation and grow their plants in cold, cold, cold areas. Now, this is the way that the earth, uh, sorry, the sun and earth, they operate together, right? Um, so the sunlight hits the earth, right? And some is, this is heat. Some is going to radiate back into outer space. Okay, it's reflected, sorry. And then some is radiating into outer space, leaving our atmosphere. Okay, that's what it's supposed to do. And now, though, we have these gases that have been dubbed greenhouse gases because the, in our atmosphere we suddenly have this all these gases they are blocking they are blocking that ability for the heat to leave the way that it was supposed to okay it's stuck in our atmosphere making everything generally hotter and hotter and hotter. Now we are burning so much fossil fuels. Um, there's anywhere from 35 to 40 billion tons of CO2 pumped into the atmosphere every single year from our factories um, you know, around the world. This is a global issue. Now on top of that, we have deforestation. They're cutting down the Amazon and all of these, uh, the tropics that we need. Remember, uh, what do plants do? They pull CO2 out of the atmosphere for photosynthesis. So the exact thing that we need to save us, they're cutting it down. And this is a huge problem. Now, you know, I'm, the main issue is the, the power plants and factories. It really is. Yes, forest fires are a problem. Volca volcanoes are a problem. These are, you know, mostly natural things. The biggest problem is the power plant plants and factories. Uh, vehicle emissions, not so great either, but it's really the factories. Okay, the carbon cycle is literally destroying our planet. It's disrupting ecosystems. It's endangering species. And they basically, you know, our entire global overall temperature is going to rise by um, 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit. And the thing is, is that might not sound like a lot, but it is enough to ruin us because you have to remember this. Okay. Uh, our poles are ice. They're mostly ice. There's hardly any land here. Now, when this ice melts, where do you think it's going to go? It's going to go right into the ocean and it's going to cause the ocean levels to rise. And what's going to happen to all of these continents? The ocean is going to, we're going to have floods. We are already having them now. Um, especially, you can see, you know, islands around the world that have lost their coastline. Um, you know, Miami has um, had to, my, the city of Miami has had to put in $400 million to pump water out of their city during flood season and that is only going to last 50 years and then they're going to have to figure out something else and the other thing is uh, you know to me is one of this is so important um, these animals are losing their habitat 
and they lo they're losing their habitat now. And you know, a lot of them are used to being able to to walk on ice and and get on ice, and uh, they're not able to. These these ice sheets are crumbling under their feet, and they're losing their their area, um, their habitat. So. Uh, you know, another thing is, uh, you know, aside from the polar bears and the penguins, these guys right here um, in Alaska, they they usually jump on these little ice sheets and they hang out. And that's what they do. Now, they're losing their ice sheets. So what are they doing? They are jam. This is a picture of them. They are jam packed on the beaches in Alaska and they're oh, this is overly crowded it's going to endanger their young like this is not what this is not good we are in trouble here all right let's go ahead and talk about the nitrogen cycle nitrogen is a, an essential element we have to have it for life and most of the nitrogen in the world is in a gas form and we need to get we need to acquire it in a solid form and who does that for us plants take it up and they have a symbiotic relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria that turn ni uh, nitrogen gas into ammonium and then from that point um okay we also have nitrifying bacteria that can okay actually I'll talk about that next let me just talk about the ammonium all right so the ammonium gets into our plants okay we eat plants um, and get our nitrogen that's how we get our source of nitrogen and we get uh, or we eat animals and we get it from them okay then at the same time these guys get decomposed all organisms, all of our nutrients, they never leave this earth. Nitrogen, carbon, they have been cycling the planet since the beginning of time. In fact, there are scientists that are saying now that we have carbons inside of our body that once belonged to dinosaurs because these these elements, they never leave the atmosphere and they never will until the, the the earth is over okay um and no one knows when that's happening but the fact is they've been here for four and a half billion years so it's even longer than us now either way so at some point this ammonia has to be decomposed and returned back into uh gas and we have uh nitrifying bacteria that will turn it into um, a nitrate and denitrifiers that will turn it into the gas. So these nitrates can also be used as a nitrogen source. So the, that's, uh, that's that. All right, we also have a phosphate cycle. This one's very simple. Phosphate is absolutely necessary for, for life. We need it, it's a, it's a key element. We need it for survival. And where does it come from? The rocks, it comes from rocks. <laughs> So typically, this is the natural way. It would, you know, it comes from runoff, okay, and then that runoff gets into our soil, and uh, and then it gets into our plants. Um, plants, okay. Now, in this is a very long process. So basically, farmers just harvest. We harvest nitrogen. They they harvest nitrogen, and put it right into their crops which causes a huge problem. So we know for a fact that nitrogen and phosphate is absolutely necessary for our plants to be successful. And we have a lot of people to feed in this world and in our country. And this is the, the United States, obviously. And what we're looking at is all of these rivers. We know that a lot of our farmlands are in the Midwest. And uh, see all of these little rivers um, they all connect to the Mississippi in one way or another they connect to the Mississippi and the Mississippi connects into the Gulf so farmers are putting far too much phosphates and nitrogen into their fertilizer and this runoff ends up in the ocean 
And what happens is this abundance of nitrogen and fertilizer, I'm sorry, nitrogen and phosphate is going to cause harmful algae blooms. Harmful algae blooms are this boom of algae that is um, dangerous. The algae is harmful. It, 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 has neuro, it has neurotoxins that kill all of the fish. And it can also affect us. It, unknowingly, you know, someone can eat fish that have been uh, poisoned with the neurotoxin and it can get into our food. Um, so be careful when it comes to fish, especially if you're visiting down south, be extra careful with the fish. This is uh, just an emphasis on the harmful algae bloom. This is all algae and it's a direct result of too much nitrogen and too much phosphate. Okay, that is the end of chapter 37.